Good morning. A mother passing by her son's bedroom, teenager. This is a class about adolescence, so child psych adolescence. Richard wanted me to let him know what the classes are. By her son's bedroom was astonished to see that his bed was nicely made and everything was picked up. You know, that portends problems. And then she saw an envelope propped up prominently on the pillow that was addressed to, quote, mom, unquote. With the worst premonition, she opened the envelope with trembling hands and read the letter. Dear Mom, it is with great regret <clears throat> and sorrow that I am writing to you. I had to elope with my new girlfriend because I wanted to avoid a scene with Dad and you. I have been finding real passion with Stacy, and she is so nice. But I knew you would not approve of her because of all her piercings, tattoos, tight motorcycle clothes, and the fact that she is much older than I am. But it's not only the passion. Mom, she's pregnant. Stacy said that we'll be very happy. She owns a trailer in the woods and has a stack of firewood for the whole winter. We share a dream of having many more children. <laughs> Stacy has opened my eyes to the fact that marijuana doesn't really hurt anyone. We'll be growing it for ourselves and trading it with the other people that live nearby for cocaine and ecstasy. In the meantime, we will pray that <laughs> science will find a cure for AIDS so Stacy can get better. She deserves it. Don't worry, Mom. Hey, I'm 15, and I know how to take care of myself. Someday I'm sure that we will be back to visit so that you can get to know all of your grandchildren. Love your son, John. P.S. Mom, none of the above is true. I'm over at Tommy's house. I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than the report card that's in my center desk drawer. I love you. Call me when it's safe to come home. <laughs> That's hilarious. You are 16 years old. What is on the wall in your room? There was a frog. A frog? A picture of a frog, not a frog. A picture of a frog. Okay that said something about friendship. Something about friendship. OK. Somebody else, you're 16. What's on your wall? New kids on the block posters. What was it? New oh, new kids on the block posters. I've been a little bit earlier than 16. OK. What do you wear? What do you wear? You're 16. What are you wearing? Like, what do you, yeah, yeah, no, that sounds weird. No, you know, like, like what, what do you typically wear? What's your typical dress when you go to school or out in the world? OK. Somebody else. Everybody else is wearing. What, everybody, what everybody else is wearing. You know my blue tennis story. What's important to you? If we have 16-year-old you here, 16-year-old Jamie, Jamie, what's important to you? What are the three most important like things? Freedom and independence. And like being able to go out with my boyfriend and not worry about what's having from home. Having a driver's license. Oh, and a car. By the way, mom, with a gas card. Insurance paid. Thank you. Actually, I'd like. That car. Whatever. What, what car would you have wanted? Um, I got a Volvo. That's nice. Safe. Safe. Okay. At least that's association. Something about 16. Well, what is the worst thing you did at 16 that you did not get caught at? No, that you got caught at. 16, worst thing you did, you got caught at. Okay. You snuck out. How'd you do that? Where'd you go? Um, 
got caught. And what happened? What was the consequence? My parents yelled at me. Grounded you for how long? A day. A day. They didn't really follow you with it. Aha! Didn't even last a day. <laughs> okay. Somebody else. Worst thing you did, you got caught at it. Did that tell you my taking the car out of the county story? So I'm 16. So my dad, so me and Michael were all just at Scripps, and my mom were going to go for the first time on a, he had a conference or something in Monterey. And it was on a Wednesday. I remember this very clearly. They were, it was just a overnight, gone Wednesday morning, back Thursday morning. Hand me the keys to the Rambler, a 62 Rambler. Even your parents might not have been born then. You know, you're welcome to take the car to school. If you want to put your board on and take it down to the shores, you're welcome to do that. Stick around, you know, we'll be back tomorrow. No problem. Well, the problem was, there was a sweeping northwest swell. And as you all remember, what's breaking at the northwest swell, sweeping northwest swell? Rincon. Remember the picture I showed you, the, my son's car at the Rincon parking lot? Santa Barbara. Ooh, a little out of county. I drove up there. I ditched school. I drove up there Wednesday morning. I figured, ooh, if I miss school, it'd be a lot less crowded. I spent the night on the railroad tracks. I get up. Actually, I did school on Thursday. That's right. I went to school on Wednesday. I left Wednesday afternoon. That's right. I was ditching school on Thursday when my parents were coming home. So I'm going to get caught. Spent the night. I get up on Thursday morning. I look, and it's perfect lines sweeping across the point and only count on one, one person out. By the way, Tom Kern incredible surfer who grew up in Santa Barbara, saw videos of Rincon years ago with nobody out, and he literally wept. One person out. Oh, now there's two people out. I will never forget this moment. The other guy took the first wave. I am at the point, there are four waves, and I choose. No, not that one, not that I'll take this one. That's a non-happenstance nowadays. I've been in Rincon now. I paddle out at dark. There are eight other guys already there at night, at dark, waiting for that first wave. Dear mom and dad, this is your former son, Yanan, because I know you're going to disown me, because to tell the truth, I'm right now at Rincon, surfing perfect waves. Whatever you do to me, it's worth it. I will be home by tonight. Love, your former son, Yanan. I don't know if she kept the note, but it's true. I don't even remember what she did to me, because it wouldn't have mattered. But what I do remember is, years later, we're chatting. And she says to me, honey, you, knew when I, you know when I knew you would be just fine in life. The time you went to Rincon, and you left a note that you would do something that was so important to you, straight out, open, honest, willing to take whatever the consequence, I thought, this kid's going to be fine in life. She was a tradeologist without even knowing it. Okay? So what's something you did wrong that you did not get caught at? Um, She's thinking. Going out, going out to parties. Okay, and you didn't get caught. Because you were telling your parents that you were staying the night at a friend's house? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, that can help in that regard sometimes. Okay. Somebody else, something else, Michelle, about adolescence. Oh. I didn't have to, that's another question. Um, same going out to parties, sneaking out, um, hanging out with older guys, anything to not OK, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. A colorful past. Very colorful. Where was yeah, this? Very safe. Um, very fun, very safe. Yeah, I always had friends. I was just... But um, in Florida. Florida. Tiffany knows I'm looking at it. Anything, what was three important things that, to you in, in adolescence? Talk to us about adolescence. Boys, okay. I was dating a guy in a punk band, so. Of course. Um, I don't know, I was just, 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 I was
I guess freedom too, just being able to get some control. I had a very constricted childhood, so I think my adolescence had Talk to us, something about adolescence, anything. Where were you when, when you were an adolescent? When you were 16, where were you? Um, mostly I was with my friends. Okay. This is was this in Japan? Where, Japan. In Japan. Yes. And what would you do on a Friday night or Saturday night? Um, try to like have a party. <laughs> okay. okay. Somebody else? Anybody else? Come on, come on, come on. Come on. I wanted to be in a music video. <laughs> you wanted to be in a music video. I love music and I just wanted to be in like a music rap video. <laughs> okay. Did you ever get to be in a music no, video? No, I went to lots of concerts. Went to lots. Was this? Where were we? This is in England. Yeah, so I thought in England. Yeah, so drinking, you can drink at 18. So at 16, I would drink. You were drinking? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I had a boring adolescence. You had a boring adolescence. Condolences. I wasn't able to do anything. I had to stay at home and spend lots of time with my family and take care of my cousins. Wow. So I didn't get to I didn't get to party until I was in college. What would you have wished to be doing at sixteen? Uh, going to parties, not having yeah. my dad drop me off at prom, having him not oh. pick me up after prom. <laughs> oh my God! He picked you up after prom. Yeah. Oh. Wow. With your date. <laughs> no, my date had to go on his own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were, you were delivered. Yeah. You're like a driver, like Beyonce. You have a driver. <laughs> Pulls up, you have a little hat on, everything. You come out in a beautiful dress and all that. You do the prom thing, and then your driver picks you up, and you leave. Right. And did you go to after prom? No. Didn't I even didn't. go to after prom. Wow. My date got to go, but... <laughs> And you couldn't even Skype you and show you what a good time he's having. <laughs> Somebody else, something about adolescence, somebody in the back. Oh, oh good, you want to vote. just reminded me that um, yeah. even though I was like, I had a lot of leniency with my parents, so I did kind of get to have a lot of fun. I also had a little brother who was only four years old at the time, or ah. like five years old. Okay. So I, and I am obsessed with children and it always happens. So yeah. I started taking care of him since he was born when I was wow. 11. Yeah. So when I was 16, I was his only babysitter. I was pretty much his only babysitter for all the years. Wow. So I was with him a lot and taking care of him a lot while my stepmom did her thing and my dad was working and whatever. So a lot of the time I was kind of like had like a mother role at 16, which I actually wow. loved. But, okay. But that's something I was doing a lot. Okay. Cool. What, what did you dream about? What were your aspirations? What were you wishing you would be doing as an adult or someday when you're 16? You, okay. Okay. And then I was in high school. Okay, you did well in school. Okay. So I was thinking about other things like the football games. Okay. 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 Do you have a best friend when you're 16? Oh, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you guys hung out a lot, or did you guys, were you texting? Probably I was pre texting. <laughs> no, not 16. I know. You guys are young, but you're not that young. Texting's been big last, what, five years, I guess. But you spent, you, what, you talk on the phone? Yeah. yeah. Please. My stepdaughter is 16. Ah. And we have her on our cell phone plan. Yeah. We have gotten phone bills that had to come in boxes. Oh, God. Oh Volume God. one. Vol the yeah. The AT bill had to come yeah. in like a file box because yeah. <laughs> there were so many pages. Oh. Yeah. Thank God she has a limited text. Correct. See, and I didn't know that when Duran first got his phone and was texting. And same, we got a bill. It was like $300 or more. And I'm like, what? What? It's got to be a mistake. So I call up and go, oh, I'm so sorry, there must be some mistake. It's like a $300 phone. Oh, yeah, it's for texting. I said, isn't that free? <laughs> I had no idea. He goes, no, 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 for every carriage. It's like, oh, my God. I just felt like totally trapped. So get me out of this. What do I do? Because I know he's going to have to text. Well, they're on unlimited plans. Sign me up. <laughs> it's been that way ever since. And then she's 
very uh, on Twitter living out this very adult drama with her boyfriend and a girl that's trying to steal him away from her. And yes. It's every day, all day long. It's yes. exhausting, actually. Important word, drama. So let me tell you my first kiss. And what happened here? Oh, I see what happened here. It rerun. That's OK. I'm going to do this anyway. I'm so sorry. It'll take me a moment. Oh, boo, his. Get back here. Go over here. Nick, nick, nick. I know exactly what happened. It did the rerun thing. Shame on you. Come on. Come back. Come back. Don't talk to me. No, oh, they just did that. Beautiful. Come on up. Come on. Good game. Thank you. Da, 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 da. Boom, ba, bum. So sorry. Don't take that much time to load. Dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, dun. Thank you. You can load now. So, okay, so first kiss. So I wasn't 16, I was about 15. I know, I was very delayed. And I'm down at the shores, hanging out with my surf bros after coming in from the sun. We're hanging out by the fire ring. It's a Saturday, it's La Jolla Shores. It's kind of a foggy-ish day. And at the next fire ring are two, I'm so sorry, chicks. Sorry, 16, we're surf guys. Actually, I was 15. And Duke Nielsen, who had a birthmark that looked like a heart on his wrist so it made him a stud man. <laughs> My nickname was Canny, Volcani Canny, nobody knew what they're called. Hey, Canny, or Canna, let's go over there and talk to those two girls. Well, I'm sorry, this is so embarrassing. I've been practicing kissing on pillows since I was about 12 <laughs> or 13. Ridiculous. But I really wanted to kiss a girl in the mouth. I really wanted to do this. So I was determined. So I look and I thought, that is the girl I'm going to kiss. I know, it's so pathetic. I'm getting, I, it's really pathetic. I'm getting nervous just talking about this. If you did that, I mean, my palms are just like, my amygdala was going, I mean, like, oh my God. Damn, I'm really feeling nervous. I didn't know about that then. So we go over there and we talk, and I suddenly go, yes, I really am. Her name was Linda. I'm really going to kiss Linda. So here's the plan. I have to have a plan. Prefrontal cortex, help me. We're going to walk down to Scripps Pier. And on the way there, I'm going to say something cute or funny. She's going to go, ha, head back, bam, I'm on her. <laughs> yeah, like that. That would have been good. Like that. That's perfect. Let me mouth's open. Sorry. But bam, I'm going to be on. I mean, I really am planning this whole thing out. Oh, God. Talk about deer in the headlights. I mean, talk about lack of spontaneity. I don't think I said a word. I was so scared <laughs> all the way walking down there. I, my eyes aren't even blinking. By the way, that's how you know if somebody's in a cult. Their eyes don't blink. Like, you just blink a little more often. It's ridiculous. We get to the pier. I haven't kissed her. Oh, God. We turn around. I realize I'm going to have to do this before we get back to the firing. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. Have you even communicated with her yet? Or you're just, this is all about the kiss? <laughs> She's just it's just all about the kiss. <laughs> no, no, no. We did chat a little at the firing. Oh, okay. Now we're walking together. No, I didn't just abduct her. <laughs> yeah, no. We're walking. We've done a little chatting. Duke's ahead of me. He's warm and on. He's, you know, he's a stud guy, right? So he's a stud man with his... He shows everybody this thing. Probably still does. We're in Whoop's Cove. That's the parking lot, Scripps parking lot right there. Whoop was, everybody had nicknames. He lived up the street. She said something. I don't remember what it was. It was a chuckle. She chuckled, good enough. I'm on her. It's all slow motion now. I, I, won't, I won't give you the visuals, but you kind of get the idea. <laughs> now it really gets slow motion, frame by frame. She goes, What did you do that for? I don't remember anything else. I swear to God, I go into pre-post traumatic, inter-traumatic trauma. I, I have no idea what happened. I don't know how we walked back. I, it all goes blank, doctor. I have no idea. Years later, I'm with a uh, girlfriend, and I tell the story as we're walking on the beach right there. And she goes, ha! <laughs> We did a redo, and I kissed her. She said, oh, that was great. Kiss me again. Thank you. Her name was Annie. Thank you, Annie. Drama. God, is it full of drama. 
So, anybody have one more adolescent story to tell or anything about adolescence? Yeah? Um, we didn't have proms or anything like that. Either. So, I guess parties. Okay. Uh, I love that I'm very honest. I have divorced parents, so I would always tell them, like, I'm doing this or that. But I remember, like, my friends start smoking pot, so I would be the one, like, don't do it. You're going to die if you do it. Be careful. So I've always been very cautious. Okay. Very Voice careful. of reason yeah. amidst the wilderness. I remember that that was the period where drugs got involved a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's more acceptance. Like they liked it to show that like, he was smoking cigarettes or stuff like that. Yeah. So I think that's a little bit part of adolescence. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. So now moving right into it. What are the tasks? And what are they connected to? Since what are the tasks results in what you're connected to? As an adolescent. Getting into college or working on it? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a life endeavor. Next, next stage endeavor is college or something. But in terms of kind of like, what's it all about? What's the developmental tasks of adolescence? And what? You betcha. Individuation. 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 In this continuum of, remember, we, we, me, me, we, which is kind of latency, come more of me. This is almost like me, not we in some ways, in their need to separate from primary family. It doesn't mean every adolescent can't be close to their parents. I was very close to my mom. That's why I'm a psychologist, as I told you. And she worked for Rogers, and the way she thought about people and what goes underneath, fascinating. Who thinks like that? Psychologists do. But man, do you have to define yourself. It's all about defining yourself, becoming a real me. That's huge. I think connection is, is a, again, I mean, it's important in your whole life, but I think in your teen years, it's really important to kind of like fit in and be socially accepted, popular. Huge. So how do you become a me, we, or a me, not we, whatever, a me? You connect to peers. You show me adolescent is not connected to any peers, and I'll show you one sad cookie. Some peer, somebody, somewhere. Right. Even in their being against all the other socias and jocks and all that, but at least some one other person they're connected to. Otherwise, you have significant depression. They have more oxytocin. It's oriented towards their peers. That's why the drama trauma on the Twitter there for your stepdaughter or whatever she is. Right? She, that's okay. She's totally connected to her boyfriend. There's tremendous energy. I told you my, what's your problem? My, my uh, blue tennis shoes, right? I'm wearing blue tennis shoes the day they're out. I, that's why I do socks now, I bet. I don't want shoes, because I was so humiliated. That sense, because you want to connect. Humiliation is when you want to connect and you're rejected and then you're not re-accepted. It's humiliation beyond shame. More oxytocin. By the way, you show adolescents pictures of faces of expressions. Show adult, adult pictures of faces and expressions. Ask them what, what expression is being shown. When you see it, when adults do it, they use a lot of prefrontal cortex along with other areas. When adolescents do it, they use a lot of amygdala. So they are a lot of times inaccurate in how they actually perceive affect, faces. So I'll say, stop yelling at me. I'm not yelling at you. See, you look, look, see that look? You look really angry. They'll a lot of times identify a face of fear as being a face of anger. So they really do misperceive. They'll be really angry at their parents and see their parents as being really angry at them. Never mind projection. By the way, they are brilliant at shifting.
you work with an adolescent and there are moments when you feel like you truly are God's gift to therapy. I've never been able to tell anybody this. The following week, I hate you. Correct! <laughs> it's like a temporary, otherwise borderline state. It's the fragile alliance. The next week, they, they, they won't even show up for the session. And then you find out they don't want to come anymore or whatever. They go all over the place. But they will shift. You work around them, sometimes you're like, like God's gift of therapy. Just give me my PhD, just give me my license. I'll just work with this population. And other times, you will feel insecure, insufficient, inadequate, any other in you can think of that's negative, ineffectual. That's how they feel. And they will diss you. They are so brilliant at dissing you in the slightest, simplest ways. I had a brilliant 14-year-old who, in group therapy, started to, it was her first session, mock me. She started to mock me. I mean, literally. I mean, literally. Every word. Every word. <laughs> I'm going to teach you psycho Aikido. I'm going to teach you a way of being with adolescents and other things. So I'm really good at this stuff. I like I love adolescents. I connect, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God. Within 38 seconds, I was just ready to choke her. <laughs> ready to choke her. <laughs> I mean, it's just emotional fingernails on the blackboard. They still don't have blackboards anymore, but it's just like, oh my God, oh my God. I finally said, in a rare moment, I got up, I shook her hand, I said, congratulations, you are brilliant at what you do. I concede defeat. Unfortunately, I have a group I have to run. I really want your input, but I can't have your input this way. So unfortunately, for today, I need you to go back to your room. We're going to figure this out because you are fabulous and I want this power to help this group, the power that you have. Not for me, but I want your power and how you use it to help this group, but not today. The amazing thing is she didn't mock me. I, I, I thought she's going to mock me at all. She didn't. She kind of looked at me. She got up and of course she did kind of like that kid she did about, like Jay does. She struts out victoriously. The next day I came to her to her room, I said, this is an impatient setting. I thought about you. I thought I was out surfing between waves. I thought about you. And I thought, wow, she's incredibly powerful. And then I thought how I felt. I felt kind of humiliated. I felt um, insecure, unsafe, inept, inadequate, and bad. And then I realized, you must feel that way. You must feel really bad inside. I want you to help run this group. Because you are going to be able to connect with these kids. They need help. You need help. I need help running this group effectively. And then you won't feel so ineffectual, ineffective, alone, lost. And she actually did. She actually bought it. The nice thing about being aware about shifting is you can use your own experience to figure out what they're experiencing and then invite them to own that. And if you say it in a palpable fashion, they will. And I'm going, yeah, I feel lonely. I felt really scared in that group. I bet that's how I end up feeling. When they reown it, then they are empowered. But they are brilliant at shifting. <sighs> Competence. Competences. What they're competent at. And accomplishments. This sounds familiar. Because this is what we were talking about with latency. Schmitz. Adolescence is latency on steroids. Sometimes literally. Or on testosterone and estrogen and whatever. Everything's up a notch. They're incredibly competent. They're more competent a lot of times than adults in all kinds of things. Never mind the techno stuff. So I, we, how, were you guys involved in sports much? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a big thing for adolescents, or rock groups. Because then they can be both with peers and express their competence and all that sports stuff and 
And again, competition, there are all kinds of things they're involved in. And that's really important. They got to have passions. 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 Now, here's this thing about dopamine. On the one hand, on the social emotional levels of dopamine in the areas of the brain, there's more dopamine. That's why, again, they really get a rush out of connecting with peers. They're so wired to be with peers. But in other areas, they actually have lower dopamine. For example, here's the little research piece. Six-year-olds, teens, adults, playing a game. Condition one, you win one coin. Condition two, you win five coins. Condition three, you win the jackpot. Little kids don't differentiate whether they win one coin, five coins, or the jackpot. They're stoked. Wow! Dopamine fires. I'm stoked. I won, I won, I won. Oh, goody, oh, goody, oh, goody. Adults differentiate, by, but they win. One coin, that's cool. Five, hey, cool. Jackpot, yeah! And of course, you know what teens do. One coin, that sucks. Five coins, jackpot. Oh, okay. It takes a lot more to get them going. Furthermore, fantasy carries more dopamine valence for them than reality. What they anticipate, what they think might be. This party's going to be so cool. We're going to go to Burning Man. Yeah! Wow! As you well know, prefrontal cortex is not nearly as well developed as all these other aspects of their brain and physio skills. So that whole judgment, future thinking, caring about consequences, much lower than thrill of the possibility and what they anticipate and think it's going to be. What an incredible recipe for total catastrophe. You're capable. Yes, you can come climb out the window at 3 a.m. in the morning. And yes, you've already made a copy of the key. Or you've stolen the key, or they've stolen the spare key, or whatever. And yes, you know to quietly, in neutral, roll it down the driveway and not start it till it's down the street a ways. You've got all that planning for that stuff. But you don't anticipate or don't care as to what's going to happen once you drive 138 miles an hour down Torrey Pines stoned out of your gourd because you're with a bunch of peers and of course if you're with your peers you're going to do all kinds of crazy ass stuff to feel connected to them plotted by them deified by them it's unbelievable the teens that we all made it through relatively unscathed given the neurobio setup but don't forget our species right our hardware is basically 30,000 years old our software's really updated. Hardware's kind of 30,000 years old. 30,000 years ago, life expectancy went on 25. So, teen, you're prime of life, man. You're boinking on the savanna to reproduce the species, and you've got to be very, very competent. It's a really different situation. So, competence, accomplishments, having passions about that is what they're attached to. Just the state of passion. It's really important, even if it's passionately against something, something, something. They get very connected to principles, ideals, like freedom. And we talked about that very, very, very fundamental sense of that's right, that's not right, and then that kind of evolves into a sense of fair, unfair, and kind of evolves in a sense of principles like liberty and justice and freedom and all that. Adolescence, you are really there by now. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is coming online more. And oh God, I remember my dear mom, very smart woman. This is the 60s. She had a magazine somehow. She worked at the library. So she had a magazine that um, came from China. And it would come every month. Somehow it would come in our mailbox. La Jolla, California, 1964, five. China's like Albania. I mean, Russia's bad enough. China, this communist nation. I was really embarrassed that just the postman saw 
that we had this magazine. <clears throat> so I begged with her, please don't have it delivered here. What if my friends found out? I remember one time screaming at her, you could be Khrushchev's wife! Khrushchev ran Russia. Because she was very left-leaning. She was also very smart. She could, I had no argument. I didn't read political science. She did. She would argue with me. I mean, she would inform me as she would see it. I'd be in tears, just so frustrated out of the principle that, no, that's wrong, I think, and no, I don't want that because somebody will see it. You fought for things that were really important to you. Things were very important. It involved principles and ideals. Okay, passions, peers, and all of this together starts helping making a you. You are a fabulously assimilative in the not we. Again, what you wear, what you think, what the music you listen to, the posters on your wall, they weren't your parents' music, more often than not. So you're assimilative. You define things as you would see them to be and want them to be. And yet you're enormously accommodative to your peers. Whatever it is that your peers are wearing, thinking, listening to, blah, blah, whether it's one peer or 50, or the nation, the group, whatever, you're enormously connected to that. So you're very accommodative to peers. It's a fascinating connection, or uh, um, ambiguity in a sense. Now it's, as you know, it's different now. God knows it's different than it was when I was a kid, a teen, and God knows it's even different than when you were a teen. Because of, when they say they talk on the phone, what they really mean is the course that they're Texting. They call it talking. They're texting constantly. They got Facebook. Did you guys have Facebook as a team? No. Yeah, I see you're, we're now really in a different, even you guys. The teens you work with are really a different generation, not just by age, but by technology, by what it is that connects them, how they connect. The mechanisms of connection are really different. Obviously Facebook, obviously Twitter, and video games. As you know, you've heard all my spiel about video games. They probably almost, or maybe some more, will spend time with each other via screening on video games than actually being with each other in person. Even when they are in person, like a sleepover, they'll be on separate computers playing a video game and actually being with each other online, even though they're in the same room. As I've said numerous times, we're doing an enormous social experiment in which we have no idea of what the real repercussions are going to be. Because we do have to make human face-to-face -face contact, I believe, <laughs> for all this mirror neuron stuff and all this empathy stuff. Just the most fundamental aspect of being human. And you know from the Avatar article and other things that yes, we can do mirror neurons with little avatars and connect with them in some way and have empathy with them, particularly if that is an avatar of a person we know, but it's still different than doing this. The whole thing in um, Newsweek, I was just reading Newsweek, ladies and Newsweek, where they're, they're gonna have perhaps free college. They're getting Yale, Harvard, all these big schools to put online through this one thing. Classes, whole courses with tests, with everything. So in theory, you could get a four-year degree and never be in a classroom like this, ever actually interacting with peers, never mind with a teacher. And hey, nothing against online education. That's fine in many ways. But if you never have this, whoa, man. Stalag's a really important person in my life. Wow, you never, you, theoretically, you get to bring never, you two were just screeners. I told you about the screen species. Came out of my office, I told you, last couple of weeks ago. And I, every, every human being I could see in eyesight was screening. Oh my God. Do, 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 do. You know all about the drugs that are out there. Never mind marijuana. Marijuana is basically legal. You can get your card. They even have the symptom list right there at the Medi store say these things, tell this doctor these things, and he'll give you the card if you're 18. Of course, you have a false idea. 
it says you're 18, 21. Ecstasy, you know, about ecstasy. You know that if you take the bottom part of ecstasy, some, you know that it comes in like this block. Ecstasy comes in a block when they make it. And they cut it. And they make it into little tabs. Well, if you get to the bottom of the block, there's some stuff in there that's similar to Drano. And that's why some kids, when they take ecstasy, die because they have a hole in their stomach. Hello? You don't know where it came on that block. It's called Russian roulette. They're competent. They can get that stuff. They can drive. So I was seeing this teenager. I believe she had alcohol problems. I believe she had substance abuse problems. She did not. So I asked her, under what conditions would you believe you had an alcohol problem? Oh, by the way, one other little sub-story. She came in all kind of bright-eyed and told me how she and her boyfriend at the time, over by UTC, there's like a overpass, bridge-like thing. It has this big like fence so the people don't jump off. Well, they climbed up to the top of the fence and stood on the edge and held hands, looking down at the traffic and sipping by. Sometimes you have to supplement for the adolescent the appropriate mm -hmm. affect. Holy shit! What? You're what? You're standing above the, 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 the roadway there? Yeah! How wide was the thing? I had this little carpet, so I had her fold the carpet to show me how wide was what she was standing on. It was about, I don't know, maybe a foot and a half. I said, oh my god, you're one sneeze away from oblivion. Hapchoo! Dung, 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 blap, blap, blap. Yeah. And she gave me that dopamine look. Like, isn't that thrilling? So, back to the drug thing. So under what circumstances would you say you have a drug problem? Well, if my friend said I had a problem. Great. If it's okay with your mom who's paying for this, and if it's okay with your friend's parents, have your friends come in. Okay. Sure enough, following week, three of her friends come tromping in. Make it very clear. You are collateral contacts. I am not your therapist. Thank you for being here. <coughs> With her permission, she's allowed me to say she is my client, as you well know. Talk to me about her. We can talk in front of her. Is that right? Yeah, you can talk in front of me. Do you have any, you know, how's she doing in terms of taking loving, responsible, respectful care of herself? Because that's my thing. I'll do that. First thing everyone I'm saying is really worry about your drug use and alcohol use. You get so drunk and passed out and then you want to drive. So I look at her kind of like, <laughs> next week, she checked herself in. Well, had her parents check her in to a rehab program. Inpatient, and then went to outpatient. And that isn't a cure. That is not an instant cure. But it helped. And she was in and out of recoveries and whatnot. She now is a fabulous 30-some-year-old woman. And I saw her one time, like years later, I've seen her since that. But years later, I'm coming up to deliver, uh, stick an envelope in the mailbox. And she comes out, and she looks at me and says, Dr. V. I'm like, we'll call her Kathy. Because I kind of get right. Kathy, you're an adult. Oh my god, you're all grown up. Oh my god. She goes, yeah. And I want you to know, it was so cool that I had some human being I could go to, and I could really say anything. That crazy life I was leading, and I could just to me. That was really cool. I want you to know you're important. I'm like, <laughs> oh. Sometimes we make a difference. It's amazing. Are you seeing, actually seeing adolescents? No. Yes, some. Right. You're going to. With fear and trepidation and excitement. Not necessarily in that order. You're excited. You're also nervous. Yeah. Yeah, so what's it like? How are you doing with that? Uh, well, mine are inpatient in the hospital, so they're pretty sick. Okay. But, um, I mean, just challenges, like building rapport and like yes. feeling like we connect. It's yes. the biggest challenge. And that is the thing you've got to most do with adolescents, is connect. Mm -hmm. And that's not reflective as they walk in the room. I mean, there are occasional. I just last night, 
had a collateral contact with a mom whose teenage girl wants to come into therapy. She says, please find me somebody to talk to. That's really cool. I've never heard of an adolescent boy, by the way, ever asked to come into therapy. I'm not saying it never happened. I, I have heard occasionally I've had some adolescent girls who actually want to come in. Most of them are like, <sighs> I have one where they had to pay him. <laughs> oh, and, he was very, and he was very proud of it. Come in, in the very first session, he says, I just want you to know I'm getting paid five bucks a session. I said, five bucks, not bad. <laughs> I saw him for a while. He was actually a, a cute kid in many ways. He was young. He was like 13. That's oh, yeah. But it was his way. He actually kind of liked it. But it was his way to sh save face. I'm not coming because I want to. I'm only coming because you're paying me. Things got worse. I, mean, I stopped seeing him for a long time. I, I reheard from him. They had to pay him now $10. <laughs> he wound up at the 20 And mom called. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> so up there. And he came in for, oh, he actually didn't come in. He's now actually going to go to a residential center. He's not really appropriate for outpatient care, which, by the way, is a differentiation you sometimes need to know. We'll get to psycho Aikido. And sometimes they need residential care. I have my inpatient. And for some reason, she was, she was my first client. Wow. And um, for some reason, I just never, I was afraid of, not afraid of her. I was, I was just very self-aware around her. Oh, yeah. And I just never really connected with her. Yeah. And come to find out towards the end of my year there that she was actually, her brother was actually sneaking into her room. And yeah. And um, just my biggest failure thus far. Oh. <laughs> just, I just felt like my failure to connect with her and put my own stuff aside was like the reason she couldn't tell me. Everyone knew something was going on, but. We talk about the, right, but the perverse protectors. We talked about how you have the protect, the initial protector is about physical safety. That helps you live in life and cross the road by looking both ways. And as by, by latency, because you start caring about how others see you and competencies matters and all that self-awareness starts to happen. By the way, the part of the brain that's self-aware in terms of, in that self-consciousness is rampant in adolescence, obviously. They are so hyper self-referent because literally that part of the brain. So their protector is huge, constant. That's really the dominant person in the White House, the proverbial White House of the adolescent is the protector. That's why they dress the way they do. They do everything to really to protect themselves from a sense of humiliation, of dis <clears throat> distance. So her levels of sh shame, fear, whatever, involving that incident, it's no wonder she wouldn't talk to you about that. Yeah, and then when it, it did come out, she, she was ashamed that she hadn't told me. Right, so she gets it. Right. Well, I told you, I have one, just a sweetheart of a 14 year old who is such, okay, you're fine, who is so, her inner critic, again, I have a gavel in my office, the inner critic, that part of the perverse protector that's just on her all the time, can be ruthless. She's better. But there are a lot of, part of our session, part of the garbage disposal part of our session, it's for her, it's almost like a confessional. Just spat out what she has, the negative thought she has. But it's so hard for her, I think I told you this, sometimes she'll just scribble. Literally, I'll say, sounds like it's really hard for you to share these. She doesn't share with anybody else. At least she shares the fact that she has these negative thoughts. I said, do you want to just do the scribble dump? Yeah. And then she literally will just, she'll think, and you can see she's thinking one thought, she'll go, just literally like that. And then, and even though she knows this is on my iPad, right, and Duke Pen is my free app note-taking thing, even though she knows that this is her sacred space, she could sue me for my $1 million liability policy if I betray your trust. She still has to, and she knows I can't read what the hell that is. There's no words. She still has to erase it so that nobody, even I, can ever see the output of that. Oh my God. The levels of shame and the level of a protector is extremely hard. You, if you're going to connect with adolescents, you have got to be genuine. Genuine. You want to say something? I was going to say, and you have to be careful how much, you have to be careful with the boundary because your desire to connect is really difficult. And then 
we run into this boundary issue just trying to connect and then... On the nose, that's so well said. That's interesting. You'll see a tape today of a group. All right. And the kids will come in and they'll ask you, you know, hey, Bill Klein, did you get late last night? <laughs> no. I don't, I don't, cause I, I don't have, I, that's fine, I don't have a problem answering that. What, what, uh, you like better on top or on bottom, Bill Klein? I'm not comfortable answering that one. No, just say that. I can't. Glad you asked. You have an inquisitive mind. Glad you want to know something about me. Want to connect with me in some way? Or want to humiliate me or whatever it is. Not comfortable with that. So that radar inside of you, that right one, this is comfortable, this is uncomfortable, you listen to that. And the good news is you can mouth that. What's amazing, we all do this, they trap us. And then you come up with some bullshit thing. You'll just say something just to say something. You know, and you try to be authoritative in some way, authoritarian. You know, I don't know. Oh my God, they got you. They can sniff it. They know. So now I'll push more. Now, I don't know. And you just, the eyes are just widening. I mean, the deer in the headlight, the car is getting closer. I mean, it's amazing to me. Again, I used to supervise, right? I ran inpatient hospitals, I ran residential centers. I used to supervise you lovely people. I tried to get you to make tapes. Oh, God, you think you're writing poems in the deep of the night. Just bring a tape. Well, sometimes you bring a tape in, and I'd freeze frame it. Because you're like, I know, we all know that feeling. What I'm hoping you're going to do next is simply say, you know what? I have no idea what to say to you right now. You're, again, you're brilliant. I'm feeling totally like, holy schmoly. And usually on the one hand, on the other hand. On the one hand, part of me just wants to say, you know what? I have no idea what to say to you right now. Oh, my God. Or I just want to confess. Now that I think, well, wait a minute, that wouldn't be prudent. Hmm, what would my supervisor say? Hmm, what should I say? Nice thing sometimes to say to adolescents is, or ask them, what should I say to you right now? What should I say to you right now? And sometimes I'll say incredible things. Well, you say blah, 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 blah. Exactly. I haven't thought of that. That's brilliant. Perfect. Blah, 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 blah. They will love you for your authenticity. They will love you for your confident vulnerability. They will. That's what they need. Again, don't forget the shifting going both ways. They're shifting on you all that stuff, all that uncertainty and security. What the hell do I do now? Oh my God. But don't you dare tell me. They're a little bit like the woman and the mom and the tape last time. Help me, help me. I've already tried that. You're honest, you're solid, you're genuine. Share what feels okay to share. The, the kids that I've worked with, who do drugs and whatnot, know that I smoked a little pot. I don't anymore, I really don't. I, I ate the brownies with a pot in it. I hallucinated and saw cartoons on the wall. Oh, wow, Bugs Bunny, <laughs> I'm giggling. Time is slowly. I'm going up Tory Pines in the fog. Maddie Welsh, I told you this. And I think I'm in London, and I think I should be driving on the other side. Thank God Maddie said, what? No, you're not in London, you're in La Jolla. Don't drive on that side, drive on this side. And by the way, shift! Because I'm doing 30 miles an hour in first gear. They know that. I don't glorify it. Did that. I took acid once, as they all know. I had a horrible time. That's it. That's done. They don't ask me much after that. Oh, okay. That's your... More importantly is, what's your drug hit? What's going on with you? But if I say, oh, well, you know, that's not appropriate for us to talk about. It's really all about you. Zip. I do think you have to share and you have to be genuine, and you're absolutely right. You have to feel what feels right to share and what doesn't. And when it doesn't say it just doesn't feel right, I see that's frustrating for you. Sorry about that. It doesn't feel right. And I hope you have that sense of what feels right and not right, and you follow that. Okay? Yeah, with uh, teenagers that, um, so I just got one transferred to me because another intern was pregnant and she had her baby. Uh huh. And so he's really testing right now. He's already admitted to marijuana. Uh huh. And he asked me the question, um, you know, have you ever used drugs? Uh huh. I don't really personally see how it's helpful to, you know, share whether I have or haven't used because that's kind of irrelevant. Like, I know he's testing to see if, if I'm safe to share his usage, but at the same time, I have had a different teenager that used everything, like, so she would ditch a lot and get told the other things. And um, she would say, well, everybody ditches. I mean, you've even ditched before. And so 
what if the teenager starts using what you share with them? So for example, you share that you've used acid once and have you know, eaten brownies. What if they once. start using that against you? I haven't so had that you, happen. So, Sorry? Well, well, you did it, so why can't I do it? You know, I'm just doing the same thing you did. Oh. Well, in fact, actually, that's going to get me into psycho Aikido. Again, I'm very, very, very clear with them. I am a care coach. I'm here to help you take loving, responsible, respectful care of yourself. There's different parts of you. There's the user part of you. That user part of you is trying to try and convince the rest of you that it's just fine to do whatever it is you're doing. I'm going to invite you to really look at whether that's true or not. Did I always take loving, responsible, respectful care of myself when I was 16 years old? Never mind when I'm now 63 years old, always loving. No. Do I strive for that? Do I strive to at least know the difference? Yes. I'm a care coach here to help you. I'll share with you the drug history because I think it might be, oh, that's really important. This isn't about kind of transference. This isn't about my getting you to like me. This is about my being able to help that part of you that takes love and responsible care. Okay. That's my ally. That's who I'm here to help. There's no way a teenager is going to convince me because I have the data. We have a lot of research on the effects of marijuana on the adolescent brain. It's not true that it has no effect. Or that. It's not it is true that if you smoke a little pot every once in a while, you at 60 aren't necessarily going to be a different human being. You smoke on a daily basis, never mind a multiple daily basis, there's no question it's going to impact. Your, your memory, your motivation, and potentially permanently, never mind your testes, that always gets the guys, what? Your balls will shrink to little babies. Below reasons. What? Yeah, see that high squeaky voice? Been wondering about that, haven't you? What? <laughs> no, it's not that bad. But it does. And I told you, actually, ironically, for the over 50 brain, THC might be helping memory. They're trying to find the right dosage. And I might even end up taking one of those little pills and say Omega, but I don't want to feel stoned. But there's data! And I have them guys say, all right, Google the negative effects. So just Google the effects of marijuana on the adolescent brain. Just Google it. Here, you want to do it right now? I know the sites. I'll send you one. I like this one because it's balanced. So there's no way you convince me. So let me go to Psycho Aikido, because that just goes right off of that. What's that? Psycho Aikido. Psycho Aikido. A I K I D O. Aikido is a martial arts in which there's no enemy, only an uneducated other. And what Aikido does is use the other's erroneous energy to re educate them. Oftentimes they're on the ground when they're being re educated. <laughs> Adolescents will challenge you in unbelievable ways. Unbelievable ways. So I have this 14-year-old. Looked like little orphan Annie. Red hair, freckles, the whole deal. Dad brings her in because he found her, pardon me, boinking on a Sunday afternoon in the parents' bedroom with a 25-year-old. Ridiculous. She would tell me with big, great, wide eyes how she would hitchhike. She lived in like Poway, down to the OB Pier. Talk about sneaking out the window to the OB Pier to hang out with the biker dudes at the OB Pier at two in the morning. What is the look you see on my face? You, Dr. V, you look worried. Ah, what are you worried about? You tell me. What are the least three things? You're worried I'm going to get hurt. Yes, rape, pillage, plunder, and other things. Dr. V, I wasn't alone. I was with my friend. Oh, oh God, how silly of me. Oh, two 14-year-olds have never been pillaged, plundered, raped, and all that other stuff. Not two, only one. What? Now, I only say that kind of stuff if I have a really good connection. Adolescent's going to say, I mean, the impatient. The, the tape you're going to see was in substance abuse, adolescent substance abuse inpatient hospital. OK? 
Okay, we actually have them. Still diagnosed with substance abuse. We have for up to three months. Oh my God, okay, I'm for three days nowadays. In the old days, three months. Now forget this guy. He, he was in juvie. He was 17 and a half, African American. Big, tough ass guy. On the streets since 12. First day in group. He bombs up. Bombs out. Goes, fuck this. Gets up, leaves. Staff comes in. I was running them. I Volcani. He's packing his, he's got this little paper bag and he's packing stuff. I think he's planning on leaving. I come walking into the room. Sure enough, he's packing his paper bag. Looks like you're packing your paper bag to leave. No wonder. The first move in Psycho Aikido, and that is when you try to persuade an adolescent not, or dissuade, dissuade an adolescent from doing what they're about to do. Amplified empathy. Looks to me like you're packing your bags. Let's be clear. You, because I looked at your record. I don't know you well. I just met you in group. But I did look at your chart. You've been on the streets since 12 or 13. Oh, OK, 12. Don't know your dad. Mom's also, I think, on the streets or was on the streets. You're living with an aunt, I think. So you've been a free spirit, to say the least. End up in juvie. You'd, you opt to be here. Now I think you're thinking it was better to be in juvie. But I don't think you're packing your bags to go to juvie. Look, in here you're told when to get up. You're told when you're going to eat and pretty much kind of what you're going to eat. Your whole day is structured. Your whole entire day is structured, including your unstructured time is structured, unstructured time. I'm going to tell you when you get to have unstructured time. Furthermore, everything you do in here is therapy. I mean, you have individual therapy. Is it every day? Three times a week you have individual therapy. God knows you have group therapy with me. And then you have these other group things. You've got, oh, I think they have rec therapy. They have art therapy, movement therapy. They have fucking breathing therapy. Oh my god, everything is therapy. How long have you been here? Three days. I'm astounded you have lasted three days. For a free spirit like you, being in a place like this must be like being under, no, it's not underwater. It must be like being in cement. No wonder you're packing your bags and you can't wait to go. You've got to amplify empathy. You've got to be genuinely attuned to where they are at. And you've got to speak their heart better than they ever could. Your prefrontal lobe, your verbal Wernicke and broke all those areas, I'm more developed than theirs. So you've got to speak their heart in a way they kind of go, huh, hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah. You get it. You get it. You get why it is. By the way, to get adolescents, you've got to be interested in what they're interested in. My kids that I see will show me their YouTubes of things they do or show me groups they love. You've got to be interested. I had a tagger. He told me what his tag. You've got to be interested in what they're interested in. You're not there to lecture them. You're not the principal's office. You're a teacher in a different way. You've got to connect. Okay. you got to... And this is kind of counterintuitive. You've got to genuinely acknowledge that they could, 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 not should, could do whatever it is they're going to do. Look, let's be clear. Here are the keys. We're back to the look, scene. Here are the keys. This is the key to the unit right here, which is pretend. He got interested. He actually stopped what he was doing and turned around and looked at me. If I didn't have these keys, and it's a race between whether you and I can get out of here first, sneak out of here. Oh my God, I'm some honky kid from La Jolla, California. You could get out of here with, the, you don't need this key. I mean, make it a little easy, you don't need that key. You could get out of here within, what do you think? 93 seconds? I mean, certainly within three minutes. No question about it. By the way, why am I saying things like 93 seconds? 
certainly within three minutes. Why am I saying that to this kid? What brain state is he in when he is packing? Correct. And what am I doing? I'm trying to bring him back to the prefrontal cortex. You use numbers, letters, logic. But you've got to do it in a way that's in the context so they'll pay attention to it. 93 seconds. By the way, it's also true. It's got to be genuine. It's true. He, within 93 seconds, will figure out, you'll watch. You'll watch for some staff that's about, that's about to leave. You're going to zip right past them. I would have no idea. I'm like, I didn't get out of here. Windows look locked. So is the door. You would figure it out. So you genuinely, and by the way, you praisefully. Look, dude, you've lived on the streets since you were 12. You've got all kinds of skills I never even, I have no idea. Fantastic. Fantastic skills. So you could, no question about it, do that. However, if you do, oh, how many, have you been here how many days? Three days. So let's see, that's 3,000 days, that's $9,000. Quite the luxury hotel here. I put it in writing. If it was ethical, I actually do this. I'll bet you nine thousand dollars, nine thousand dollars, that if you leave here, what you could do. See, he's expecting me to say, "Oh, you're leaving? No, you're not. We're going to have Bruno and the boys here, and they're going to gang up on you, and we're going to have one on one. No, we're going to have four on one watch on you, twenty-four hours seven. You're not getting away." Nah, nah, nah. And he's like, "Oh, oh, 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 I'm so intimidated." So you don't do that. Take this whole win out Sega. Yeah, you could do it. Because you're in all kinds of ways smart. But here's the problem. If you do do that, I would bet you the $9,000 that within one hour to certainly 24 hours, one day of being on the outside, you will do something self-destructive like you will use drugs. You will have unprotected sex. You will beat up somebody. You will steal. You will, I guarantee it, guarantee it that you will do that. The fascinating thing is he didn't turn around and say, no, I won't. What he did say was, I don't care. Whoa! So he actually jumped all the way down to here. So this is what happens. However, here's the negative. That's what's going to happen. And here's the alternative. I say, you know, I don't know you. Here's the deal. I saw you in that group before you decided to leave. And I saw the look in your eye when Kathy was talking about being molested by her dad. I've rarely seen a teen look so compassionate. It was really strange in a way because your eyes looked really compassionate and your mouth looked furious. Like, I think you wanted to kill her dad, her stepdad that was molesting her. So you had this dual thing. But the thing is, you have this part of you that really cares for others. I think that's such a pity that that part that can care for others and whatnot has so little regard for yourself. And I do think if you stayed here, if you stayed here, here's the good news, I do think that some of that part that cares for others can actually be taught to care for yourself, that you can learn something about yourself that's worth caring about. But don't decide now. I am leaving. I'm hoping you're going to stay. He stayed. He stayed for this whole time. Let me give you one other real quick one, these principles. Actually, let me give you two others. Another one from this place, another one from St. George. I'm seeing this kid, an outpatient, he needs inpatient. We take him there. It's a little tricky, but we decide that's okay. I'm seeing him then individually in David Bergman, medical director's office. He's sitting there in the desk, and then Bergman's office is very nice with the teak wood and family <laughs> photo and all that stuff. He's saying, suddenly, I'm not going back to the unit. <laughs> I'm not going to go back. Kind of like, you can't make me. So what's the first thing you say to him? I'm not going back to the unit. That safe place sucks, man. Southwood sucks. What do you say? Uh, I understand being locked up on a unit does suck. It sucks to be here, and you can't be with your friends and do what you want to do. And you just have to sit here and listen to everything that we want you to do. Beautiful. Very good. I even failed it. Like, yeah, can't argue with that. Right. So you're going to help me not have to go back? Furthermore, I know I can't make you go. Well, how many people would it take to get you to go back? What do you mean? Like, if we had to, you know, look, 
If I say you gotta go, you're gonna go fuck you, you're gonna start screaming and yelling. How many people are gonna have to come in to grab you and do that whole deal? Eight. Oh, okay. Who's on board today? So he starts listening to staff, and one of them was this really big guy. He said, Thank God Ralph is here. The guy's like a linebacker. Which leg would you want him to hold? Your left leg or your right leg? Why am I saying left or right? Thank you. Also, it's the illusion of choice. He's feeling helpless, hopeless, no choice. I'm stuck, I'm trapped. So I gotta give him this illusion of choices. You're gonna choose who's gonna hold you. What leg? Well, so we go through all these different, these arms. What did he want me to hold? His face. I said, oh great, so you can spit in my eyes. <laughs> Kids love to spit. You know about if you get bit, what you do, right? You know about this? Lesson 101. If you're about to be bit, or do get bit, I know they got the scar. I'm so sorry, I know this sounds cruel. You push in, they'll let go. Don't pull out. The reflex will pull out. Well, that tears the skin. Hello? Just go, Because they will bite you. The other thing they'll do is smash their head against your chest really hard if you're holding them from the back. So if you're holding them from the back, you've got to hold them really tight. Used to be very good at getting kids on the ground within 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. We're on the ground, I'm doing this now, we're rolling around. Dum, 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 dum. So we go through all the different people that are going to hold him. We go through the fact that I know you're going to, let's see, you'll probably kick that photo out. I'm being the external ego to use an old analytic concept. Because that's what I want him to be doing, going, oh, you know, if I do this, then all these things are going to happen. Remember the protocol? Kind of like that. We're gonna walk you out, we're gonna, then we go, God, if you're still screaming on the unit, all the kids are gonna be looking, oh wow. You go into the rubber room, yes, we really have a rubber room. Do you want the Thorazine or Haldol in your left butt cheek or your right butt cheek? That'll be your choice. Because they'll try and get it down your mouth, you're not gonna take it. What's for dinner tonight? Huh? What's for dinner? Chinese. You know, I gotta tell you, the food here sucks except for the Chinese. It's the one time I stay late, because I like the Chinese dinner. What are they doing then? Um, it's movie night. Movie? You get to choose them all. Okay. So, rubber room, held all on your right cheek, or Chinese food, and movie. Tell you what, I'm gonna go and meet with your parents for a sec. You let me know what you wanna do. Because don't say, what are you gonna do now? Uh -huh. So I actually got out of the room and I started talking to his parents. He walks out and he goes to the door. I love this moment. He's knocking on the door and he says to me, Hey, Volkani, come on, hurry up. I want to get in. I love saying, hang on a minute. I'm not through with your parents yet. And it's like he didn't realize the irony that he's asking me to hurry up to get him in and I get to say, no, you don't go in yet. I'm going to give you one other one. We'll call her Martha. St. George Holmes, Berkeley, California. Circa 72. Martha's running from the day center into the house. I'm the head resident. I'm chasing after her. She's picking up a chair. She's about to throw it through the window. I say to her, you are so angry. That's not a big enough window. I think you ought to throw it towards that window. That's a much bigger window. Let me be very clear. It's plexiglass. What's the worst going to happen? Pops out and good old Michael Thor is going to have it in by this afternoon, 4 o'clock. What's the worst that's going to happen? Don't want to throw it at me. So, okay, but I, mean, I really did say that's not a big enough window. Your anger is so huge, I want you to throw out that window. And then I want you, and I really did say this, I didn't know about all of this then, but I kind of figured I needed to distract them. I then want you to walk out the, is it four or five steps? I can't, one, two, three, five steps, pick it up off the lawn, it's north of UC Berkeley, north side there. And come back in, and then I don't know whether you should pop out the left window or the right window, that'll be up to you. Then go, and by the time I got to that, she looked at me with a lot of disgust, I put the chair down and went, oh, fuck you. I'm going to my room. Actually, I'm going back to you, and this sucks. Bye. Okay, it's like prescribing. Now, I already told you about setting the fire. I didn't remember that one. About to set the fire, the kitchen. Right. I didn't say, oh, don't use that. Use that curtain because it would go up in bigger smoke. Never prescribe anything that you can't actually live with. That was the omelets throwing the eggs at each other. Okay. So the steps quickly are amplified empathy, 
you agree with the possibility that they could do these things, whatever it is, and you agree with a complement to some underlying trait that they have, that you genuinely can see as to why they can do this. You say, nonetheless, if you do do this, let me be your prefrontal cortex judgment part, dorsolateral, and tell you all the negative things that are going to happen if you do it. Let me also say, if you do the alternative, the positive things that are going to happen, you decide. Is that really taking a lot of responsibility for taking care of yourself? What astounds me is that they never argue with whether it is or isn't a good thing to take care of themselves. Other than saying, I don't care. But they don't argue about the content. I'm talking about my Italian stallion. Italian stallion. Some abuse. Inpatient. No, residential. He decides he wants to use. I say, okay. Paint us the portrait. Let's say the program didn't work. You're going to go back out and you're going to use. You're now, it's now 10 o'clock, Thursday, 2020. What are you doing? I swear to God, this is verbatim. What am I doing? I'm dead. Oh, oh. This is in front of the whole group. What, what age did you die at? 19. Oh, where'd you die? OB. Oh, well, what would you die of? Well, what do you think? Paul Connie, I died of an overdose. Oh, I want you to look at yourself. Dead, OB, you seeing it? Yeah. Look at your feet. Do you have any shoes on? No. What do your feet look like? And he starts describing in great detail all the kind of worn calluses and the toenails that are just all filthy and like bent over because they're grown out so much and whatnot. And I have him do basically on up right to his teeth. Look at your mouth. When was the last time you brushed your teeth? Uh, I, I don't brush teeth, man. So open the, open the gums of your dead body. What time is it? It's like early in the morning. The sun was shining down. You could see all this like brown tartary. I mean, it was just disgusting. Hi. Right. So, okay. Freeze frame that. Take that DVD out of the mind or the YouTube video. Program works. Ta da! You stop using drugs. It's that same date. What are you doing? I'm getting ready to go to work. Oh, this is verbatim. Oh, where do you live? OB. Oh, where in OB? He had the exact pad. I actually happened to know because I surfed OB Pier once. I knew exactly the pad he was talking about because it overlooks west and south. It's right on the corner of that. I go, oh, that's cool. So you live there. Right, where do you drive? Way before your time, there was a guy named Magnum P.I. It was a TV show. You remember? Selleck in his finest. Right, look at that look. Oxytocin, testosterone, estrogen, dopamine, all combined. He read, it was a red Ferrari. So what's he driving? He's driving that red Ferrari. So, okay, got your OB pad, red Ferrari. I love this line, a true line. Significant other? Three. <laughs> oh, you have three significant others. Yeah. Okay, you said you were going to work. What are you doing? I'm a banker. He's not a drug dealer. He's a banker, a legitimate bank. And this is my favorite line. Okay, so you see this up. You're getting ready for work, blah, blah, blah. You're going to eat a what are you wearing? Italian suits. Oh. Now. Okay, so you see future, you got your Italian suit on, you're in the red Ferrari, you got your OB pad, blah, blah, blah. Three significant others. Ask him how he got there. And if it's okay with you, tell us what he says. Ah, oh, shit. Well, what do you say, what do you say? Work your program. Which is, of course, what we've been telling him all along. I said, the Italian stallion's my man. That's my co-therapist. You see, adolescents are brilliant at doing this. Let me do it in body motion. Bam! In your face. Bam! In your face. <laughs> I'll see it on the unit all the time. Fuck you. That's an hour room time. Fuck you twice. That's two hours room time. Within 31.3 seconds, woo, 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 woo. Got 15 staff all piled in this guy and hauling them up. They're incredible. But your task is doing this. I'm not going to hit you like this. 
I'm going to draw them like this. And I'm going to find an ally in you because guess what? The battle is not with me. The battle is with the part of you that's a drug user. Now, if I said to him, and if you keep using drugs, you're going to be dead at 8 to 19 and old be, and your teeth are going to be rotten, and your feet are going to be all gallows. Mwah! It's like, I'm saying that a lot today, but I guess if you're working with adolescents, they do that. <laughs> I use that language with them, not because, ooh, I'm going to fit in, because it does come kind of naturally in that context. Let them say it, and then find the part that's the healthy part and go, that's my ally. How do I help healthy part? Oh, healthy part in there. Hello. You'll see the essay tape. You'll see how, what part you wants to use. I, I know a part of them always wants to use. Never pretend you don't want to use. I sometimes say, well, how, what percentage are we dealing with today? 99.9% .9 or 3%? What am I up against? What is the part of you that doesn't want to use up against today? That's my ally. The part of you that takes good care of yourself. That's my ally. Got to find it. Your courageous part. Got to find it. Okay? Feel the canvas? Kind of get the ideas? Imagine you're running tapes of kids. Just keep sick. And if you don't know what to say, say that. I don't know what to say right now. I will think of it. it might take me a little while. I'll come back to it. What should I say to you? What should I say to you right now? No, I don't know. Okay. That's okay. No, no. I'll think of it. Or sometimes I'll go in the corner and start muttering. I'll get up and go, God. And I'll do a lot of on the one hand and on the other hand. On the one hand, I think the kids should be doing blah, blah, blah. If I tell them that, they're going to go, oh, God, you're just a control freak. You're just another one of those yank, yank, adults trying to run my life. So I don't want to do that. So on the other hand, I think I'll do, I'll ask them what I think I ought to do. That's what I'll do. That's incredible modeling for them. Like, oh. Not everybody has answers, and you can try to puzzle it out, and you have different parts, and, you, have, and uh, you come up with something, or you try something out, or you ask somebody else. This is cool. They will love you for it. They will love you for your genius, because the real, real reality, they really do want an ally. Their healthiest part does want an ally. And they're looking for one in some way that they can connect to and relate to and, and that can move with them and keep supporting the part of them and keep seeing the genuine part of them that's healthy and adventurous and brave. Okay? Okay, we're going to take a, some short break. I'm so sorry because there's so much to cover. But we're not meeting next week, so please come back at 10 after and we'll switch to group. Okay, okay we're back. Everybody signed in? Yes, yes, yes? Okay. I need a brave soul. I need to get in contact and touch with your inner brave one because I want one person to come up here and do something that's very brave. You feeling brave? Part of that brave part of you? Yes? Come on up. And you're not going to sit there because it looks like you're looking to sit there. Let me tell you what we're going to do. This is very important, okay? This is a technique. Obviously, you never do a technique on anybody unless you've done it yourself. Okay? It's very powerful. Here's what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to have you talk to yourself in the mirror. Okay. Okay? You feeling a little anxious as I said that? A little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So here's the way I'm going to have you do it. I'm going to have you talk to yourself in the second person. So instead of my saying, I'm talking, trying to explain this, you, you know, are talking, and you're trying to explain this, and you're hoping that you're trying to that you're clear. Okay? Okay. Okay. Now, before I have you sit down and do that, I'm going to have to be behind uh, some, some ground rules. Most everybody on the planet, the first thing they do when they see their, themselves in the mirror is they criticize themselves. They immediately go, mm -hmm. To find whatever it is they don't like about themselves, some little thing, and go right for that. Okay? Okay. Give me the critic. Give me your critic. Do you have your critic? Oh, sure. Give them to me. Yeah. Or her. Is it him or her? It's a uh, her. Her. Okay, we're going to put the. She, she, where should I put her? Maybe under the box. Under the box. Okay. I know she serves a purpose. I know there's all kinds of reasons why you have the critic. I'm not saying you're never coming back. I'm not saying you're not useful. But I don't need you now. She doesn't need you now. Okay? Okay. Okay. 
You're going to talk to the best friend you've ever had in your entire life. You're going to talk to the person you've known all your life. You're going to talk to the person that you're going to know all your life. You're going to talk to that person with love, care, sensitivity, compassion, respect, genuineness. Okay? okay. <sighs> the good news is there's no wrong way of doing this. If the critic starts to come out, I'm going to say, whoa, 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 sounds like the critic. Let's put the critic back over there. Okay. What am I supposed to say? You're wondering what you're supposed to say. You can say anything you want. For starters, just look at her. Tell her, tell her. Yes, you're sitting. Tell her what's going on for her right now as you are talking to her. You know her better than anybody on the planet. You know her better than, and you have perfect empathy for her. Tell her what's going on for her right now. Well, I'm feeling a little nervous. Tell her you're feeling a little nervous. Feeling a little nervous. You're doing a beautiful job. But um, you are harnessing your inner grade one, which is which is a good thing, and that's always in you. Excellent. And you are. Am I just making stuff up, or just or whatever? Okay. Is she wondering what to say right now? <laughs> yes, I'm wondering what to say right now. T tell her you're wondering what to you're say right. You're wondering what to say right. Beautiful. Now. I know it's it's hard to learn at first. Once you get this, but it'll it be really easy. doesn't matter. Right. No one's really gonna. Remember. Okay. <laughs> she needs, it sounds like she's wanting some reinsurance or something. She needs some reassurance. I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay. All right. Okay. If she did, you say, it looks like you need some reassurance. Let me reassure you. Nobody's going to remember. But if not, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any advice you might want to give her? And if she doesn't want to hear it, you can say, I know you don't want to hear this. Nonetheless, I have a little advice I'd like to share with you. And then whatever her reaction is, you have perfect empathy. So you always know what she's reacting, how she's reacting, what you're saying. Okay. Um, I'm feeling a little nervous. Okay. Um, so I know, yeah, I know you sometimes forget that, um, that whatever happens in your life, you always can learn from it. So you should not feel as anxious about certain things in the future. Okay. How does she feel when you said that? Tell her how she's um, feeling when you just said that. It might be part of you felt this way, part of you felt that way. Okay. So part of you felt um, that 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 makes sense, but then part of you also felt that um, sometimes there are reasons why you have concerns for the future, and that's okay. Okay, so the two of you will discuss that further at some point, <laughs> sounds like. An ongoing theme, perhaps. Okay. Okay, you're doing fantastic. You're, you are very brave. Tell her if one, two, three things, whatever it is, that you deeply respect about her and or that she respects about herself. Okay. If you're telling her something she respect, that you respect about her but she doesn't believe it yet, say something like, I know you don't believe this yet, but you will come to see the truth and that is you are blah, blah, blah. Okay? okay? I know, this is hard. I know. So she's feeling challenged right now. Um, he likes Stuart Smalley. Sorry? <laughs> I feel like Stuart Smalley. Oh, okay. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Um, one great. So, what am I saying good things about? Absolutely. Okay. Tell her what you respect uh, about her. I really respect the way um, you incorporate your your values and principles into everyday life. I think that's something that's really um, something that's hard to come by sometimes. So. Very cool. She believes that. She owns that? Yeah, I believe, yeah. Perfect. You believe that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, Do you have one other thing you want to share with her in terms of that? What's your respect? Um, and it's okay if you don't, because that was a lot what you just yeah. did. No, I think I would say I respect your um, tenacity and persistence of what, of pursuing things that that you get, your tenacity about getting what you want out of life. I think that's really neat.
fantastic. If it's not too hokey and you're willing to do this as a closer, let her know you are always there for her. You will always be there for her. And I will always be there for you no matter what. She believe that? And Does she believe that? because it's me, but no. Well, <laughs> different parts, a different part. When you look at her and you tell her that, does she believe that? If not, you can say, I know you don't totally believe that. Part of you doesn't believe that. You'll come to see that this is, I speak my truth and your truth. I will always be here for you. Uh, she believes it. Okay. She will, I will, is it I will always be there for you? Yeah. Okay. You believe, you believe that, that, that I will always be there. here for you? And I'm glad you believe that. I'm yeah. glad. And I'm glad you believe that. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions, action, and as you did that, talk to how was that? Totally strange. Okay. Yeah. But I think the idea that by framing it as that's like your best friend yeah. you know, forever and it's easier to do that. Because I immediately thought of one person who, what I, what I would say to that one person, I wouldn't necessarily think of saying something like that to myself. Okay. Thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions as you watch that. What do you think? Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. I think we probably experience it when we're going through everything that we go through in this program, how sometimes disconnected we are to ourselves. Talk about having a unimonic state with yourself when you really connect. When, it is amazing for all that we look in the mirror how little contact, connection we make with that person who is us all our lives. Really connect, really look yourselves in the eye in face and connect with that person and not be critical. It's astounding. And that's unimonic. And there are moments, it only happens in a second where you suddenly connect for a moment. Other thoughts? You had somebody else had some other hands around. I wonder if there's differences between somebody who has character pathology and somebody who doesn't. You know, does it come easier to somebody that feels comfortable saying things to themselves? So, Southwood inpatient drug program. We had a guy there who was a heroin addict, which is very unusual in those days in particular. And he would um, rob people who were, as they're coming across the border. He was not a nice man, young man. He was so brilliantly sociopathic that he did exactly everything right in the program. He would talk about his feelings. It was just creepy. So we were having a um, treatment team on him. About that. How are we going to touch this guy? How are we going to get to this guy who does, who's just chameleonating? I walked out of the meeting. He was right there. And I said, God, I'm call him Harvey. Harvey, I can't believe you. We were just talking about you. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we're worried. Yeah? Yeah, we're worried that we're not able to impact you at all. You're doing everything perfect, but somehow we feel like we have no impact on you at all. What's the perfect response to that? I mean, perfect response. No, you guys are helping me so much. No, no, no. You're right. You're right. I'm worried too. I mean, that would be nice, but no, you're right. I'm worried too. I, I, you know, I thought the exact same thing. I went, Harvey, you're doing it right now. I, 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 yeah, I, I. Harvey, come here. We're going. We're going to the bathroom. Huh? Don't worry about it. Two other guys came with me, stood in front of the mirror. Now, in that case, I was directed. I said, I want you to look at him, you. I want you to talk to him, second person, say, you, I see you. And I want you to talk to him. Notice how I'm backing off. When I want people to talk to themselves, I want to be way in the back. And all I'm doing is listening very, very intently to everything you're saying. I want you to talk to him about his loneliness. It's all. So what happened? He goes in the mirror. Fuck. And he got like white like. I said, what, what happened? He said, I don't know. I just got really, really scared. I said, high five. That was real. That was genuine. That was awesome. Good work. Enough done for today. Remember the pimple theory of affect versus the coffee grounds? Pimple theory is all these icky feelings. You have to scream, yell, encounter group. I've done my encounter group. Hit the pillow with the tennis racket, scream, yell. And you get it all out. I know, gross analogy, but since we're on adolescence, it's like popping pimples. Coffee ground, it's this dark, mucky stuff called feelings that are, we're being protecting ourselves from. Have a good filter. 
You don't want to flood somebody. Be patient. Drops at a time, they'll have a nice brew. That was, that was really genuine on his part. It scared the shit out of him. My dear mentor, Tom Rusk, worked with very wealthy, successful, narcissistic-ish type folk who were very suave. And that parking lot looked like symbolic motors, all these fancy cars and whatnot. The one thing they couldn't get around is looking themselves straight in the eye and be able to say, I feel really good about who you are. I feel proud to be you. We can't lie to ourselves. It's astounding. I mean, we'll avert, we'll do all kinds of things. We can't lie to ourselves. We can't look ourselves straight in the eye and lie. I mean, maybe some mutant sociopathic far enough away. But the general 99.9% .9 of the population can't lie to ourselves. What happens is we get scared and move away. And then you can compliment. If the person refuses to do it, compliment them. Say, that's great. Because this is about taking loving, responsible, respectful care of yourself. For you in this moment, and I'm pushy, and you're able to push me back, your inner take great care of yourself said, this isn't good for you right now. This is too much for you, maybe. Good for you. So there's no wrong way to do it except being critical. So you've got to watch the critic. And when the critic comes, you go, whoa, 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 there's the critic. Now, the good news on the critic, I've had people look in the eye and say, it hurts me to see how critical you are of yourself. What I've never seen anybody do is, God, you're so compassionate to yourself, it's disgusting. Never seen that. The compassionate one wins. Even if we can't do it, we can have compassion for the fact that we're so self-loving. It's an incredibly powerful technique. Obviously, don't have anybody do it unless you've done and do it. I've done that a lot. I mean, it's automatic. Because what are we doing, ladies and gentlemen? That should sound very familiar to you. That's what we've been doing from the moment I met you. You are reflexively reflecting, literally, your thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions. You're being your own best play therapist. It's a way of being with yourself. What this is all about is a way of being with yourself. Take a loving responsibility. Impactful care of yourself by having that inner, compassionate, wise one that you can connect with. It'll be there all your life. That's really what this is. It's not like a motivation speaker or something. I'm not selling mirrors. It's okay. Okay? You getting this? That's really that's why we're doing this with the kids, because we want them. It should be really easy for them by the time they're 30 if they've really had this kind of relationship, where they've been valued and validated in a psychoanthropologist sense, underlying the traits. They can, this would be easy for them. They've been doing this all their lives. They've been internalizing it. Okay? Okay. Adolescents are very, 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 very peer-oriented. Therefore, one of the greater interventions for adolescents, of course, is group therapy. Group therapy will be the best or worst experience you'll ever have in doing psychotherapy with adolescents. Group therapy with adolescents, oh my god. Those little piranhas will eat you alive. I mean, they really will. It's astounding. It's Tuesday afternoon. You're driving. You hit the stoplight, and suddenly you have this. <gasps> Your cortisol levels are flowing. You're telling me something, you're going, oh, that's right, I have a group tomorrow. Shit. I mean, that's how bad it can be. I mean, really, I'd have interns that are just freaking out. If I sent you into a group next door, if there was a group, I just sent you into your no done group, what a lot of people do is they try to do what I call hub of the wheel group therapy. They basically, hello, they try to do individual therapy in a group context. So we'll just pretend it's an inpatient kind of setting. So you're the therapist, and you have them actually, don't do this, you just have them talk to you. So how was your past, Bob? How did things go with your mom, Jane? And they just all talk to you. And by the way, they'll conspire with you, they'll love that, they'll just chat with you. Well, it might be of some benefit, but that's not group therapy. Furthermore, you'll have them, and nothing wrong with this, sit around and talk about their feelings. Most adolescents, unless they're loquacious ladies, hate talking about their feelings. None of that, they'll just talk about negative feelings and just escalate. So how do you feel? How do I feel? This place sucks. I hate this place. I hate everything about this place. I hate this group. I hate you. Well, this is productive. See, I told you. It's not productive. It's stupid to sit around and talk about my feelings. Talk about my feelings. Fuck you. There's a feeling for you. Is this productive? I'm bored. <sighs> this is boring. When do we get out? You're like, oh, God. 
Now, can we get out now? Can we like never come back, please? I don't get paid enough. This is an internship for God's sakes. I don't get paid for this. This is ridiculous. And then they'll gang up upon you. Never mind the one who mocked me. But then they'll gang up on you. Oh my God. Oh man, look at your socks. Oh God, you're like, ah! <laughs> With our dear Southwood interns, first of all, we learn very quickly. You don't just send them in. Here, go do group therapy. We need you. We need you. Go. They're like, ah! You read Yalom. That's wonderful, brilliant. It's not going to help you probably immediately with these obstreperous teenagers, recalcitrant. So we would have them join us, us meaning Greer Essex. Greer Essex ever gives a class in here, you take that class. You go to one of her workshops. She is fabulous. She is a body movement therapist. And she, is, she knows the psyche soul through the body and movement like no other. And she's a fabulous human being. So in any event, she and I ran these groups together. So we would have the interns be with us. And watch. And then interns get to do what I call pieces. What I did with adolescents is you will see them, we'll do them today, and you'll see them there. There's pieces, because they are action oriented. And they would love to engage with the peers if you can kind of structure it and have it be something you know how to do with each other, so you'll see. So we had them do pieces with each other instead of with us, and we have the interns sit in, and eventually, interns get to run the, the group, but the interns, I for intern, sit outside the group and help make some directive comments, because this is where the action is. So, rather than the hub of the wheel model of group therapy, I like the pool player model of group therapy. The balls are the group participants. In any group, there's a powerful one. The tape you're gonna see, you'll see Katie. Katie has the power. She's highly respected by her peers. She was on the streets since age 12. She now, fortunately, has been at Southwood long enough that she is anti-drug. She was my co-therapist in many ways. She was the most powerful one there, and she was fabulous, so I could use her. But let's say, Jamie is the powerful one. And let's say she's obstreperous, non-cooperative. I want you to cooperate. I want you to talk about your past. If I ask you to talk about your past, you can go, Phew. I am you, the group therapist, is not on the table. You're out here. You happen to be rooming with her. You happen to like her. She's cooperative. So I ask you to share with the group something about your past, you will do so. Ah, la, 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 la. So I'm, here's the cute ball, here's me. Boom. You guys are roommates, let's say. You guys are buddy yet special. Ask somebody in the group to share about their past. You ask her, she shares. Of course, she's not gonna say no to you. Ask Jamie to share. She's not gonna say no to you, she will share. Boom, boom, eight ball, corner pocket. Get the idea of this? You're, you're looking at this as a group. You're trying to figure out who's connected to whom and how do we get this group to evoke the healing part in all of them, each of them, and use this connection, this oxytocin, dopamine, norepinephrine connection that they have for each other to move this, not against you, but against their own darkness. Now, God knows it's hard enough to shoot a three ball pool shot. People change all the time. Maybe they're in a fight with each other. Maybe, God, it's incredibly hard. But what's amazing is how cooperative they become when you do pieces. So, so here's some example of pieces. Actually, I'm gonna show you a piece right now. Come on up. Pick somebody in the room to be Six-year-old you. Perfect. Center stage. The good news is you don't have to do anything but look cute. You look cute. Introduce, what were you called at age six? Did you have a nickname or anything? Uh, Thursday. Thursday? Yes. As in today? Right. Okay, you were called Thursday. You're Thursday. Fantastic. Thursday. 
as opposed to my man Friday. And anyway, all right. Tell the group about Thursday, six-year-old you. Describe her for us. What is she like? What's important to her? Tell us about her. Um, she is uh, kind of like a leader, also very in touch with feelings and emotions, artistic, does ballet. She's a ballerina. Um, and loves singing and loves spending time with her family and is kind of a mediator in both her family and in her career. Fantastic. Group, anybody, quick question about Thursday. What is she, what is she, uh, does she have like pets or dolls or what, what kind of thing? She has cats. She has a particular cat that's particularly important to her? Oh yeah, Ruffles. Ruffles the cat. Beautiful. You want to hold Ruffles? Perfect. <laughs> Any other quick question? Just a quick question. Anything? Does she have um, like a best friend or a group of close friends? Or? Um, she's friends everyone. Yeah, she has a best friend named Bose, who okay. she went to preschool with. And she goes home with her after school every day, and then another friend, Brendan. Okay. Beautiful. Hang in. Thursday, a question for adult you. It can be tried or profound. It doesn't matter. A question for adult you. I'm sorry, what was the question? What's a specific experience that really influenced your life? Okay, so you're wondering what future you, what experience influenced future you? If there was any particular experience that you're willing to share. You can always choose not to. Yes. Um, probably um, being able to stay home with the phone call. Wow, cool. Wow. <laughs> Some little something you want to tell six-year-old you. Again, can be trite, profound, doesn't matter. Tell her. Um, something that I want to tell a six-year-old me? Correct. Okay. Um, you're going to have challenges of losing parts of yourself. Um, but hopefully you can regain those parts of yourself at a later time, but there's going to be times in your life where you have to kind of put some of your wants, needs, interests on a back burner for a greater good. Wow. Well done. Well done. Well done. Very well done. Brave. Both of you. Brave. Okay, starting to get the sense of this. Teenagers love doing this. They love doing this. They'll pick people. In fact, as you'll see in the group, they'll say, hey, wait, my turn, my turn. I want to run. I want to do this. And the group's going best when they run it. You create the pieces. You teenagers create the pieces. Yes? Um, and I'm eating to respond to and um, here quickly. And the, one of the best things is that the adults that we have are usually younger, like college students for the most part, so there is still that adolescent feel to them. And we call it awkward, where oh. we basically say, okay, we're just going to let you talk it off to the next person, and we really have that opportunity to interact and, and there's more of a coach cohesion there with us as well like they're having to force. Right. It's a long tradition, psychodrama, gestalt groups, long tradition of doing these kinds of role play. And you can, you can have future you, past you, any of those kinds of things. But the groups we had, I'm, Kids would, if a kid ran, they'd put an empty chair, they'd talk, everybody would talk to that kid. You know, issue with a dad, they'd talk to the other dad. I remember one was so moving. It's easy to identify with the victim within the kids we treat. It's hard to identify with a perpetrator. And we realize that some of the kids we treated are perpetrators, not so much of sexual crime, but they would beat up other kids. And there was one where she said, yeah, I, I remember driving by this movie theater, saw this girl, she looked really cute, and like a cheerleader. So I called her and then I beat the shit out of her. Just out of obviously jealousy, envy, whatever, envy. 
So I said, wow, let's do a piece on that. Why don't you choose somebody to be the girl? And she said, I'll never forget this. Oh, that's too easy. I'm going to teary out. No, I want to talk to her dad. And I want to tell him what I did to his daughter. Oh, my God. Not a dry eye in the house. It was unbelievable what she said, the confession she made to this dad. Remember one guy, just this kind of very oppositional withholding. We used the camera. We said, we're going to pass this camera around. I want you to say something to somebody you wished you'd said to that you've never said it to. And this kid spent five minutes of pure poetry talking to his dead grandmother, telling her where he was, how he got there, where he wanted to be. And when interns, other people are like, oh, God, it's so hard to work with. I said, watch this. Get a different view of who you might be. Okay? There's all kinds of little techniques you can do. You can all, I can do this. You can all get out a piece of paper in the group. We're an automobile. Write down everybody's name, what part of the car they are. And then we share that, and you keep track of what everybody says about you. That's a great little technique. What's amazing to me is they never insulted anybody. It amazes. You're the exhaust, man. Nope. Oh. You're the radio, you're the entertainment, you're the brakes, you're all that. I mean, it's just fabulous. Metaphor group. I'm a seal. You are, pick anything. Lion. Lion. You are love, you are a key, you are the sun. You, I mean, you just, we all, and then we start making up a story. Once upon a time, there was a seal, and he went to the sun, and the sun said, whoa, man, talk about play therapy of the mind. We're a magic mind. So we love that stuff. Yes? Do you ever do things in the beginning to kind of get the kids close to each other? Like something, like I did something in my class the other day where I guess she, I think she called, Dr. Marcy called it essence. Okay. Where there's an inner circle and then there's an outer circle and you have to rotate around so that everyone has a turn to talk to the other person. And okay. you say, like the person asks a question, so if this person was a car, what kind of car would they be? Oh, okay. And it's about their essence. It's not just what they look like. So you okay. think about them as a person. If they were a state, what state would they be? And Beautiful. And you just kind of go around, and I actually found that people who I didn't even really know that well, like the teacher's assistants in the class were like, knew, like said things about me that were so spot on that I was just like it's shocked beautiful. that they could get that from my essence. Beautiful. Really know I don't know that particular one, but yeah, I mean, usually I mean, the group, no, that's great. That's, that'd be a great thing. There's a lot of ways. The main thing is to get them connected. If they say, I don't, I don't trust this group, I'd have them get up and go to each one of them and say one way you do trust them and one way you're not sure. They'll come up with, I trust you to take care of this man. I, don't, I mean, it's, get on the interact. Very powerful. Oh, here's another one. Never forget this. So this kid left the program, ran away, used, came back, and it doesn't matter if we did future him, whatever, he was not going to not use. So I said, let's have a funeral. The part of you that doesn't want to use is dead. So I guess we just need to honor that fact and have a funeral. Who wants to play part of him that doesn't want to use and be dead? So we've got, we lowered the lights. I had him move to the end of the room. You just sit in the end of the room, we're going to have a service for that part of you. And that's what we did. Career got out her drum, dong, dong. And each member would come and say something to the dead part. I thought, this is cool, this is good, this is powerful. And I had this vision that we were all going to lift this corpse, this person playing this, and there was a ping pong table. We were going to bury the corpse behind the ping pong table, which happened to be right next to where this guy was sitting. And then we would all leave and we'd just leave him with that part. I thought that'd be good drama. This is good. So I'm about to do that. And one of the kids said, Well, maybe he wants to say something to this part. It's like, Oh, you don't care to me. So I look at him and he goes, Yeah. He gets up, falls to his knees, and cryingly says, Oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do without you. Oh, God, I'm going to miss you. Oh, God. And I go, Hallelujah, resurrection. That part of you is right there, because otherwise you wouldn't be grieving it. It's like, huh? Get up, get up, hug, group hug. Oh, my God. All kinds of fabulous things happen. You can also take traits, qualities inside of you. Come on up. You're going to do this. You're brave. You can do this. I want you to think of a trait, quality, and attribute that's not one of your strengths. Something you'd want to work with, change, or something. Maybe procrastinate or whatever it is. Oh, okay? that's a good one, yeah. Procrastinating. Procrastinating. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, that was easy. Yeah, that was. Pick somebody to represent the part of you that procrastinates. 
Ding. Who was that? Whoever felt pointed to. Whoever felt pointed to. Okay, perfect. Well, don't you want to kind of wait before you get up since you're procrastinating? Okay, good enough. I'm, time is going to start evaporating, unfortunately. Okay, perfect. Perfect, okay. Now, there's also obviously the part of you that gets things done. It's the opposite, the yang. Yep. Pick that part out. And they'll come right up here immediately. Okay. Come on up. <laughs> You're the part of Emily that gets things done. Okay? Come on, come on, come on, you can do this. I know, you feel it. Yeah, it's all right. You're doing a great job just doing it. So, you guys obviously are in the opposition. What would you like to say to the part that's getting things done all the time? You're the procrastinator. What would you like to say? Go ahead and say what you want to say to him. Don't you have better things to do? <laughs> Don't you have better things to do than get everything done all the time? Okay. What would you like to say back to her? She procrastinates. She just hangs out. She's the inner slacker. Uh, round to it. When I get around to it. Sempre manana. Manana. Why do tomorrow when you can do it the next day? I don't know what to say. <laughs> you don't know what to say? Okay. Help her out. What is she, she saying to her? Um, the last time you procrastinated, you got really stressed out when you had that paper due, and it didn't feel very good, so you need to stop procrastinating. You caused so much stress. You can't believe how much stress you put on her. Constantly. Just slacking off. Slacking off. Oh, yeah, we're going around to it. Man, look at it. Her hair's going to get gray like his. Oh, my God. Okay? Yep. What would you like to say to both of them? Um, I understand that there are other things you prefer to be doing right now, but another part of you knows Come that up. when you procrastinate, it gets really stressful at the end, so it would be better to just do a, a, a piece of your work now and then take a break and then come back to it. Okay. How about you have a playful one, a relaxer, that can relax after you get things done. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Come on up, a relaxer. Perfect. Perfect. So you, very good, thank you. You look very relaxed. So you have something to say to both of them, it sounds like. It sounds like you want to say to the slacker, look, look, hey, you're right. She needs to, she needs to kick back some. No question about it. I'm going to take care of that. Okay, I'm going to take care of that. You're absolutely right. She needs to get some things done. I'm going to make sure that the slacker only is there for a little while. I'm going to relax her. Then she's going to be better prepared to get things done. Something like that, okay? Okay. Go ahead. But there's times when you need to relax, calm down, do nothing, don't work with them all the time. And there's also bad stress. So sometimes we need to go ahead and let the go-getter person go get things done. So then she can relax. Okay. You're willing to trust that she, let, let's get in contact with a part of you. Let me put it differently. Get in contact with a part of you, Ms. Slacker, that's willing to trust. You can tell her. She's going to need to relax. I need you to help her relax. Okay? You go to her. Willing to do that? Mm -hmm. Very good. You're willing to trust that she will see to it that she gets things done once she's relaxed some? Uh, yes, but last time we did that, we she didn't wasn't there. Finish. She oh, was okay. being too powerful. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. I'm glad to get to her. It's like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> You're right. She was too powerful. She is committed to going to her now. Okay. You commit to go to her also and okay. saying, she needs to get some things done. Okay? Okay. You're willing to give that power to her? Yep. Okay, give, officially tell her she has that power. You have that power. <laughs> Ta-da! Okay, very good. Very good. High fives or whatever. No, group, group, group. High five. High five, everybody make contact. Wait, the two of you got to make contact. It's like a toast. Very good. Well done. Getting a sense of this? You can take any trait, any quality. And what happens is you're going to, if you really listen to people, you're talking all kinds of different traits and qualities. And you can keep adding more people and more people and more. But you just have the whole room up there. The other thing that's going on, by the way, is it connects the different people. You might always remember Jen as six-year-old you. It connects people when you have them play out these parts. Okay? Okay. I want you to see bits of this tape. We don't have time to see the whole thing, but we'll see pieces of it. What this is is, oh, I gotta refocus that. I make sure this is on the screen. And this is out of the way. This is a group therapy tape. Mm -hmm. 
It's very clear to me, these wild, obstreperous, some abusing teenagers, we only have three months with them, and that's a lot. Nowadays, you don't have that much time. They're going to go out in the world, and they're going to be at a party. Hey, good to see you, man. You want to try this doobie? It's got some bitch and stuff on it, man. That's what they're going to be faced with. That's real life. How in the hell are they going to say no to that? Unless they practiced saying, cool, man, nah. they got to practice that. So I called it an inoculations group. We're going to get inoculated to the real world. So I had to bring in their real bongs that actually smelled like real dope. And their whiskey bottles and whatever else their paraphernalia was. Bring in the real deal, because that's what's going to be out there. No, we didn't bring in real drugs. We used, you know, um, tea for pot. And we used uh, saccharin or whatever those sugars are for crystal and whatever. This was the hardest group for the recovering staff. Recovering staff is smart. They keep away from all this stuff. These kids are not going to be keeping away from all this stuff. So I'd have them practice. And we had different types of groups. On Wednesdays was an inoculation group. Now, they knew they were being made a tape. So I had them go through a whole bunch of different inoculations. Usually I would, I would expand on one. But I want to give you some samplings. Lights, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I apologize for Ken, this is not a great quality tape, but you'll be able to hear it. Tim, so Tim, over here, you'll get to know him a little, his parents are dealers. They had him be the mule at age six, because nobody's going to stop a six-year-old, and he'd go hand drugs and get money. Six years old. Do the camera. He didn't want to be on tape. So you prescribe the symptom. <laughs> Kid barks. Oh, I'm so sorry, Sadie. Aww. So sorry. It's like a dog. There's a dog here. There's a fellow dog in here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Kid barks. I go fantastic bark. End of the group. I want you to do ten different animal noises that you teach us how to do. How much time do you need? Two minutes. Five minutes. Okay. The one. The only real law of the land is behave respectfully. I can't tell you to respect each other because respect is earned. Behave respectfully. You don't swear at each other. You don't, you don't make it unsafe for each other. And they'll find ways. The, the rule was, this was brilliant, the rule was that you had to sit with all four, you know how kids sit like this? 
with a chair back up, you know, this is way back. Well, they had to sit all fours. So what was the way to sit on all fours and still somehow be a little nick? You sit up with your tush. I won't do it because I can fall. You sit with your tush on here and your legs on there. Kid did it. I went, God, that's brilliant. Got all, he said, hey, I got all fours and I'm facing the group. That was the other thing. You had to face the group. Brilliant. Now that you've shown us, please sit. And he did. So the only real, real rule was behave respectfully. Sorry, Steve. So if they want to act out in front of the camera and all that, go ahead, act out in front of the camera for three, five minutes, whatever. Get it out of your system, and then we move on. Now, two of the members of the group were brand new. Brand new. The others um, have been doing this. They know all about inoculations. Yeah, they just volunteer. I want to knock like Tim. I want to knock like Tim. Okay. 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 to Caltrans, I bought that stop sign because I wanted to have a mnemonic out in the world to remind them to stop using drugs. So you'll see whenever they're doing inoculation in the background is a stop sign. And that became the unit's logo was a stop sign. And I told them, every time you see a stop sign, remember it means stop using drugs. Every time you see the uh, color red, stop using drugs. Okay, so it became, and they got it. Look at how well he explained inoculation. So you get in the habit of not, of saying no. What's the purpose? So you can stop using drugs. I say stop in the name of love, self-love. But notice their participation. They're like, yeah, no, I want to inoculate it. That's what you want. You want that energy. You want that pureness. This is fun. This is helping them. Because I want them to have a new association when they go to that party. They might be, in fact, one kid said, I went to a party I used, but I've ruined it for me. Because I kept seeing a fucking stop sign. I kept hearing my peers saying, ooh, and you, and you, like ruined it for me. I said, great, that's what I want. I want to get inside your head. I want your peers to get inside your head. So support the healthy part of you that doesn't want to use. So you take lemons and care of yourself. Hey, So I set this up. This is directive. This is therapist directive. I have a very clear intent. I want you to learn to not use. I want to strengthen the part of you that doesn't want to use. So I want you to get in contact right now with that part of you that doesn't want to use. Okay, oh yeah. Because it's going to be challenged. Stop, Why don't you, why don't you move over so the gentleman can move his hand here? Okay. Still an army.
As a therapist, first of all, notice I'm not part of the group. I'm standing outside the group. I'm just watching his face the entire time. And I'm supporting every time he is doing no, that part of him, the no part. And I go, good, good. When I see that he looks like he's kind of gay, I say, well, you might like, need to leave. He doesn't. But that's, you are the co-therapist with that part of him that doesn't want to use. And that's what you're watching. You're watching his face. Mm -hmm. Just like with kids, I'll say, watch the face, watch the face. Challenge me, give me more. Two inoculations, and then we'll summarize and we'll stop. Two more. Okay, we'll get the next one. Notice how, no, no, this one's going to be very good. Notice how the peers are saying, stop, stop. That's what matters. I want that voice in their head, the peers. And listen to Katie on this one. This is Monica's very first group. She's going to be inoculated. She's extremely self-hating, bulimic, has lots of self-issues, and uses uh, crystal. No, I mean it. Instead of her. He liked her actually. Listen to her voice. Yeah. I know it seems bizarre and absurd and 
Notice how they never question my created reality, that the drugs ruined your life. They just accept that as a reality, and then they'll fill in the blank as to how it did that. Do a little more. Maybe stupid? In what way? How do you mean? Tell them how you made it. Um. <laughs> You're doing real well. Um. I don't know if you think that Mostly is to support Katie, as Katie's saying, think of what that did to you. Like, good, Katie, good, Katie. Holly's saying, yeah, think about how it ruined your family. Good, Holly. You're a coach, you're a cheerleader, you're a creator of reality. What happens next, we don't have time to run through it. Katie does a piece with alcohol, and she's obviously uncomfortable. So I say at the end, I say, tell this group a way, some horrible thing that happened using Seagram's. I have no idea, but I'm going to frame it that way. I said, it's about Seagram's, and she's obviously, she said, that was really hard for me. I said, I could tell. Tell this group one thing that happened that was awful on Seagram's. <laughs> They'll listen. And I said, listen, listen. She's going to say something important. Well, we, oh, the time I got raped. Wow. And then Sensitive Tim says, oh, say it louder so the camera can hear you. Thank you, Sensitive Tim. <laughs> Amazing. And then she talked about how she got raped. So then I say, tell this group how you deserve a better life than being raped. Well, I can help people. Perfect. Group, tell her how she's helped you. Make the group prove her point. Okay? Later on, we do a drug tug. The part that wants to use, that never be the staff, is pulling. The part that doesn't want to use, which is the inoculee and others, make sure that part wins, pulls. I want you to feel in your body, you're making a stand against the party that wants to use. At the end, I have them all close their eyes. I'm holding the stop sign. Imagine a time you're about to use. Don't use. Imagine you're about to use. Describe it for us. Open your eyes now, describe it. I'm at the beach, I'm about to use. Blah, blah, blah. Go back in the image. See yourself about to use. Freeze frame. Open your eyes. I scream. Stop. With the stop sign. They're like, whoa. You can only use this once, really powerful. I say, okay. Go back into your image. See yourself about to use. 
hear my voice, see that stop sign or other voices, see yourself not using. Not using. He's doing that, everybody's doing that. Okay. okay? Getting a sense of this? You love these groups. If you're going to do groups with adolescents, get them connected by getting them involved. Thoughts, feelings, fancies, any questions? Anybody doing adolescent groups right now? You are. You are a brave soul. You're the only one in the entire class right now? Yeah. You're, and you? Brave soul. You can start, I mean, it's hard if you haven't been trained. I would go around, one of the other Southwood houses had somebody who was lying at a community meeting. So I would go, I had him stand up, what do you think I did? I had him choose somebody that represents the inner liar. And they talk about why they lie. And then we talked about the consequence, we had other, what he could do instead. You can get them, they love doing this, but you gotta kinda know how to do it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's a really hard thing. Okay. Please stay. We need you to complete this on me. James is going to coordinate that. I thank you. I hope you have learned to be reflexively reflecting of kids. I hope you've learned some specific skills. I hope you've gained further valuing of the metaphoric magic mind. I hope you've clarified some of your own psychophilosophies. I hope you've sensed even more what an awesome species we are and that you are bitching even greater than you know to be. I hope you go and take loving, responsible, respectful care of yourselves and may you live your life as play. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Okay. Oh yeah, somebody's, who's doing a question for today? You're going to do a Hi! <laughs> I heard you went to the ER, urgent care or something. No, no, it's fine. I'm just sorry. Was that... You did a question for today? Fantastic. Oh, that's right, because you were assigned to do I hope you didn't come in here just to do that question. <laughs>